Barakatu. Today, we will present a new subject on pediatric surgery, which is meconium disease. Actually, meconium disease is very important for all pediatric surgeon and its associated cystic fibrosis disease. Our ILOs will be what's meconium disease, what is cystic fibrosis, and what is the differential diagnosis of obstruction, what is complications, and what about the prognosis of such infant and the children. At first, we must speak about neonatal intestinal obstruction. Neonatal intestinal obstruction is a common cause for admission to the neonatal intensive care unit. Actually, it forms about one third of all admission to the neonatal intensive care unit. Failure to pass meconium, abdominal distension, and pelvis vomiting are the whole mark for the neonatal intestinal obstruction. However, the etiology is different between different causes of pediatric intestinal obstruction. Meconium disease refer to meconium alias and the meconium black syndrome. And the differential diagnosis will be related to anatomical, metabolic, and functional obstruction. So we may have gut lumen obstructed due to certain pathology like atresia, volvulus, ischemia, or inorectal malformation, Hirsch-Sprung disease. Or on the other hand, we may have the gut obstructed from the meconium itself, what's called meconium disease, or we can call it diseased meconium. So in such cases, the pathology in the meconium itself and the gut lumen is open, no problem or no functional abnormalities, no mechanical intestinal obstructions. However, the cause is related to the meconium itself. The disease here will be disease of the meconium. The meconium is thick, sticky, and adhesive, insubicated, causing obstruction to the uh, gastrointestinal tract in the neonatal period. So the obstructions may be related to anatomical causes or maybe atresia or maybe functional obstructions due to functional causes or the obstruction may be related to the meconium itself. In all causes of the obstruction, there is failure to pass meconium. However, the etiology is different. As we see here, this is insubicated meconiums or meconium billets forming obstructions at the terminal alien. So meconium alias is a unique type of neonatal intestinal obstructions caused by disease the meconium in which the meconium is sick, adhesive, insubicated, forming obstruction at the terminal alien. It accounts for about from 10 to 30% of all causes of neonatal intestinal obstructions will be related to the presence of the meconium alias diseased meconium or meconium disease. Meconium alias mostly associated with cystic fibrosis and it may be the first manifestation of cystic fibrosis we can say that meconium alias is basognomonic for cystic fibrosis. Meconium alias without cystic fibrosis may happen. However, it is very rare in certain cases of pancreatic ablesia and total clonic agangliomosis. The differential diagnosis, usually based on other causes of the neonatal intestinal obstruction, where there is an underlying cause for the obstructions, maybe atresia, maybe Hirsch-Sprung, maybe imperfect, maybe related to volvulus, malrotation, ischemia, where there is underlying cause of the obstructions. However, in the meconium disease or meconium alias, 
the obstructions is related to the meconium itself. Meconium ileus can be uncomplicated, means simple occlusion by stick adhesive meconium, or may be complicated, may be present with volvulus, atresia, necrosis, perforations, and peritonitis. Also, we may have what's called meconium equivalent or distal ileal obstruction syndrome. We will discuss it. Cystic fibrosis. All clinicians involved in the management of the meconium ileus patient must understand what is cystic fibrosis. And excluding cystic fibrosis is mandatory in all patient or all children, all infant with meconium ileus. Cystic fibrosis is a potentially lethal genetic defect, mainly affecting Caucasians. It is an autosomal recessive disease. In cystic fibrosis, there is a mutation in what is called cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator gene, CFTR gene. And as a result of this mutation, there is decreased or impaired clearance of all secretion all over the body from all tubular structures. These impaired secretions may affect the lung. At the first presentation, there is maybe recurrent chest infection, atelectasis, lung collapse, pneumonia due to retained pulmonary secretions and retained mucus. This pathology may affect the gastrointestinal tract. Maybe there is mucoviscidosis of the all exocrine secretions due to abnormality related to the chloride and sodium. So all secretions of the gastrointestinal tract, including pancreatic secretions, will be stick and thick mucoviscid secretions not passing well inside the duct. Perhaps it may obstruct the, these ducts. Abnormal bicarbonate transport, abnormal pancreatic development. This infant may have pancreatic ablesia, fatty replacement of the pancreas, pancreatic insufficiency, fibrosis, even destructions of the whole pancreas. Number four, meconium-induced bowel obstruction, which is meconium ileus. So meconium ileus may be one of the manifestation of the cystic fibrosis disease. So every clinician and every pediatric surgeon involved in the management of meconium ileus must put in his mind that the disease may be genetically related and that cystic fibrosis must be excluded in this infant and the children. Clinically or clinical presentations of the cystic fibrosis, there is will be chronic infection of the respiratory tract related to the retained secretions, atelectasis, maybe insufficiency of the exocrine pancreas no exocrine pancreas functioning at all, uh, maybe elevated sweet chloride level. There will be elevated sweet chloride. Also, we may see in the clinical presentations congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens. And this defect occur with severe genetic mutations. So this infant or children will become an, an infertile adult male later on due to congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens. Prenatal diagnosis of the meconium ileus. Can we diagnose meconium ileus prenatal? Yes, and this is the importance for the antenatal care. We can use prenatal ultrasound. Actually, prenatal ultrasound will diagnose both types, simple and complicated meconium ileus. Also, we can perform MRI. MRI will show the distribution of the meconium inside the small and large bowel, and it will clarify the level of the obstruction. So it may act as what's called fetal enema. 
Number three, if we suspect meconium alias, we must perform cystic fibrosis screening for the mother. And there is now a recommendation that all women of the reproductive age must undergo cystic fibrosis screening. Why? Because if we find cystic fibrosis, we may perform, in certain cases, termination of pregnancy. The characteristic finding in the prenatal ultrasound in a case of simple meconium alias will be the hyperechoic intra-abdominal mass. This hyperechoic related to the presence of insubstantiated meconium. Normally, there is normoechoic or hypoechoic. Number two, there is will be dilated bowel loop. As we see, dilated bowel loop with hyperechoic or whitish structures. This in the wall, this is hyperechoic insubstantiated meconium plus non-visualization of the gallbladder. So this is the prenatal diagnostic criteria in a case of simple meconium ileus. On the other hand, on a case of complicated meconium ileus, also there will be dilated hyperechoic bowel loop, plus maybe abdominal calcification, ascites, or giant pseudocyst formation related to the intrauterine perforation and calcifications and formation of pseudocyst. There is maybe finding called meconium periorchitis. Meconium periorchitis, when peritonitis occurs, spillage of the meconium to the scrotal sac may lead to formations of what's called periorchitis, and it is diagnosed by the prenatal ultrasound. However, surprisingly, this finding is not an absolutely related to the meconium alias. As we can see that hyperechoic bowel may be seen in Down syndrome, intrauterine gross retardation, prematurity, in uterocytomegalo infection, intestinal atresia. So it is not specific and sensitive for the detection of meconium alias. Moreover, bowel dilatation, may be seen in a cases of mid-gut volvulus, congenital bands, intestinal atresia, internal hernia, meconium plug syndrome, and Hirschsprung disease. Furthermore, absent gallbladder may be related to biliary atresia, may be related to certain diaphragmatic hernia chromosomal abnormalities. Also, MRI, as we said that it will clarify the level of the obstruction, will show the meconium distributions and will perform assessment of the colon and rectal content. So we can describe it as a fetal enema. So it is important to know that prenatal diagnosis will be suspected with an ultrasound in case of simple or complicated meconium ileus. However, this finding is not a 100% diagnosis. However, you can suspect that this infant may have meconium alias. In such cases, you must perform carrier screening for the, to detect the genetic mutations in the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator gene. Clinical presentation of the meconium alias. We will shift to the presentations, postnatal presentation of the meconium ileus. Simple meconium ileus. In simple cases of meconium ileus, most newborns are healthy immediately after birth. However, abdominal distension and pileus vomiting usually develop within one to two days. Also, normal meconium will not pass. Number four, there is maybe dilated visible bowel loops on the abdominal wall, as we see in the picture. These dilated bowel loops have a doughy character. What's doughy character? That it indent on palpation due to presence of the meconium inside it. Rectum and the anus of the infant often appear narrow, and this is maybe misinterpreted as an anal stenosis. 
because usually the obstructions at the terminal ileum, so the colon will be empty and we have what's called microcolon of disuse. So also the anal opening uh, will be very narrow and often mistaken as an anal stenosis. In cases of the complicated meconium ileus, the infant usually present within 24 hours of birth or may be symptomatic immediately after birth. If in utero perforation happened uh, during intrauterine life. Also, the infant may present with peritonitis in the form of abdominal distension, tenderness, abdominal wall erythema, and edema and sepsis. As we see, as we see the abdomen distended, there is erythema, tenderness, and sepsis. Also very common associations between the meconium ileus and the eugenio ileal atresia. And about 12 to 15 to 17% of these neonates will have a cystic fibrosis. So any neonates with eugenio ileal atresia and abnormal meconium presentation, whether meconium ileus, meconium black syndrome, or meconium peritonitis should be undergo testing for cystic fibrosis, which is very important. Any case of eugenio ileal atresia associated with an abnormal meconium presentation should be scheduled for testing for the cystic fibrosis. Postnatal diagnosis of the meconium ileus. In postnatal cases, the first investigation will be plain X-ray. The second will be contrast enema, and the third will be diagnosis of associated cystic fibrosis. As we see for associated cystic fibrosis, we have the genetic mutation test, sweet test, immune reactive trypsinogen assessment, and the stool analysis. In simple meconium ileus, the plain X-ray will show dilated Powell loops. However, without air fluid levels. Why? Because the thick meconium prevent air fluid interface. So we have a dilated, only dilated power loops without air fluid level due to presence of thick meconium. Or we may found what's called bubble soup or soup bubble or ground glass appearance due to mixing of the air with thick meconium. Multiple bubbles filling the abdomen. There is multiple bowels. This is in simple meconium alias. Dilated bowel loops without air fluid level. Number two, soup bubble or ground glass appearance. Very important diagnostic signs. On the other hand, on complicated meconium alias, we may find peritoneal calcification if there is intrauterine perforation or uh, meconium peritonitis and free air fluid level uh, however, it may be minimal or absent. In such cases, the diagnosis may be misleading, leading to the diagnosis of uncomplicated meconium ileus. Contrast enema, very important, both diagnostic and therapeutic, number one. Number two, it must be performed under fluoroscopy to avoid iatrogenic perforation of the rectum or colon. Number three, we will find what's called microcolon of disuse, small atretic colon filled with meconium pellets, called microcolon of disuse. During the test, if the contrast skipped this meconium and passed to the terminal ileum, there is maybe complete or partial resolution of intestinal obstruction. However, when the contrast fail to reach the terminal ileum, surgical exploration is usually needed. As we see in such case, this is the meconium, the contrast is stopped and cannot pass to the dilated segment above due to tight obstruction. In such cases, surgical exploration may be needed. Diagnosis of associated cystic fibrosis. It is mandatory that when you suspect 
or diagnose a case with meconium ileus, you must exclude the presence of cystic fibrosis. You must perform genetic testing for the cystic fibrosis transregulator mutation. Most laboratories can identify over 90% of this mutation. However, there is still 10% not diagnosed with the genetic screening. The gold standard will be the sweat test. Sweat test depend on collection of the sweat from infant skin, not less than 100 milligram, and then chloride and sodium levels measured in this sweat. However, it's mandatory that the baby weight not less than three kilogram or more. And the finding will be as follows if we find chloride more than 60 milli equivalent per liter. This is diagnostic for cystic fibrosis. Sodium 60 milli mole is diagnostic from 40 to 60 will be borderline and blue 40, it will be negative or normal for cystic fibrosis. Number three. Immunoreactive trypsinogen assessment. This test is available in many countries. Also, a stool analysis for albumin and trypsin and chemotrypsin. So, we can understand that the importance of meconium ileus related to presence of exclusions of cystic fibrosis. Any pediatric surge involvement, involved in the management of units with meconium ileus must exclude presence of cystic fibrosis. As the association nowadays recently published to be 100%. What are the differential diagnoses of the meconium ileus? We said at the start that if we have a case of neonatal intestinal obstruction, the etiology may be related to anatomical or functional obstructions and may be related to the meconium. In all cases, the presentation will be the same. There is absence of passage of the meconium or failure to pass meconium, abdominal distension, peleus vomiting. So it is very important to put that the etiology is different. We may have a case with diseased meconium, the pathology in the meconium itself, and this is almost genetically related to the presence of cystic fibrosis. Or on the other hand, we may have atresia, Hirsch sprung uh, functional obstruction. So the first differential diagnosis is what's called functional gastrointestinal dysmotility. Very common, affecting the preterm or low birth weight infant. And actually it is very difficult to differentiate from meconium illness. May be attributed to some sort of intestinal immaturity and also may present with a complication like necrotizing enterocolitis spontaneous perforation. Second is intestinal atresia. Intestinal atresia, there is well be failure to pass meconium, abdominal distension, respiratory distress, pileus vomiting. However, abdominal X-ray will detect distended bowel, air fluid level, and typically no air distal to the point of atresia. Number three, intestinal malrotation and mid-gut volvos. It is a surgical emergency. Usually there is a bilious vomiting in a previously healthy infant. Acute mid-gut volvulus could be associated with meconium ileus and cystic fibrosis. Hirschsprung disease, especially total clonic agangliosis or extended small bowel agangliosis may mimic the presentations of the meconium ileus. However, in Hirschsprung rectal examination will reveal a tight anus uh, with release of gases and fecal matters under pressure. Also contrast, enema and biopsy will help to reach the definitive diagnosis. The fifth is the meconium black and what's called neonatal small left colon syndrome. Meconium black syndrome is a large bowel obstructions by meconium black, and we will discuss it later. Small left colon syndrome, this is a type of the neonatal intestinal obstruction reported in the infant of the diabetic mother, and the contrast will show narrow left colon. 
also hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism, although it is not a surgical problem, delayed passage of the meconium with uh, subocclusive clinical disease for intestinal obstruction, maybe the presentation making misleading for the diagnosis of the meconium illness. So we may have recent classification to classify meconium ileus into cystic fibrosis related meconium obstruction, which is a well-known meconium ileus genetically associated with cystic fibrosis and non-cystic fibrosis meconium obstruction. In non-cystic fibrosis, we can put other causes of intestinal obstructions with underlying pathology. Spinal maturity, mid-gut volvulus, Hirsch-Sprung, hypothyroidism, a small left colon syndrome. However, if we suspect meconium alias, you must exclude cystic fibrosis. How we can treat meconium alias? The treatment will be divided in two R, whether non-operative management and operative management. Actually, we start like any cause for neonatal intestinal obstruction with resuscitation, intravenous hydration, antibiotics, rail insertion and the gastric decompression. Then we can shift to water soluble contrast enema under fluoroscopy. If these non-operative measures fail, now we will shift to the operative management to evacuate or remove this insubicated mecone. So the non-operative management for the simple meconium ileus will be resuscitation and water-soluble contrast enema under fluoroscopic control. It is very important that this water-soluble enema must be performed with the neonatal surgeon attending the procedure. And we must inform the parent that we are ready for any emergency surgery as intestinal perforation may occur during the test, during the evacuation, during the enema, perforation may be occur. So patient and surgeon must be ready for an emergency surgery if intestinal perforation happens. Enema act as uh, causing extra luminal fluid to be drawn in the intestinal lumen, hydrating and softening the obstructing mucosa. We can use also warm saline containing N-acetylcysteine to help the complete evacuation. So the conservative measures or non-operative measures for the simple meconium obstruction will be the same as any case of neonatal intestinal obstruction, starting with resuscitation, IV fluids, and uh, prophylactic antibiotics, followed by water-soluble contrast enema. This enema will be both diagnostic and therapeutic to help to dissolve this obstructing meconium. We can help this by adding the N-acetylcysteine. It will draw in fluid into the intestinal lumen, trying to hydrating and softening the obstructed meconium. If evacuation field or the enema field or doesn't reach the dilated proximal bowel, in such cases, second enema is allowed. However, operative indicate, indications in peritonitis, or clinical deterioration of the child, or two failed enema washout. So you have two trials to perform enema. The first one, if failed, you can do the second enema if necessary. However, there is no more than two chances to clear or to dissolve this insubicated meconium. Following successful evacuations, we may add about five milli of N-acetyl cysteine solutions every six hours through the nasogastric tube to liquefy the upper GI secretion. Also in each infant diagnosed with cystic fibrosis, supplementation with pancreatic enzymes is mandatory when the obstructions subsided and removed. Potential and serious complications of performing enema is a rectal perforation, which increase with re repeated enema. So please careful placement of the catheter under fluoroscopic control without inflating the balloon and performing at low pressure and low volume 
to avoid these serious complications of rectal perforation. Now we will shift to the operative management of simple meconium illness. If the conservative measures fail to remove this obstructing meconium, so the indications will be failure of the non-operative treatment or inadequate meconium evacuation, unsuccessful to enema at washout. Number three, if perforation happened. In these three indications, we must convert to the operative management. Operative steps or operative approach when you are called to operate a case with a meconium alias after field evacuations by the conservative measures. You must perform four essential steps. The first step is complete abdominal exploration. You must perform complete exploration starting from above to below. Number two, you must perform complete bowel examination, searching for perforation, searching for associated atresia, searching for associated anomalies, searching for calcifications, ischemia, midgut volvulus. Number three, you must perform evacuation of this insubicated meconium. And this is the main goal, whether to perform appendectomy or enterostomy or to use a stoma. This is all methods to evacuate the insubicated meconium. And don't forget to take a biopsy. Importance of the biopsy is to diagnose that there is maybe cystic fibrosis by certain histological pictures, maybe associated total colonic agangliosis or extended small intestinal agangliosis. So these are the four essential steps when you operate on a case of meconium ileus. Exploration, bowel examination, evacuation of the insubicated meconium, and finally, don't forget biopsy. When we start to speak about the operative evacuation of the insubicated meconium, the first line is to perform appendectomy. And using the appendicular stun, you can use or irrigate with the water soluble contrast. You can add uh, two to four percent in a style cysteine or saline. Also, you may help your uh, softening or evacuation by injecting this in a style cysteine or saline through the nasogastric tube. Then you will send the appendix for histological examination. Cystic fibrosis finding will be goblet cell hyperplasia, accumulated secretions within the creptus or lumen. So this is the first method to evacuate the insubicated meconium is appendectomy and using the appendicular stump. The second one is in trostomy. In trostomy, you make a burst string on the anti-mesenteric border, small incision, and insert silicon catheter, and sick meconium can be milked or removed, removed through the entrostomy or milked toward the colon. However, avoid exposures of the meconium to the peritoneum to avoid meconium peritonitis. You can lift T-tube entrostomy for post-operative bowel irrigations, decompressions, may be used for pancreatic enzyme supplementations, may be used for uh, installations of certain feeding. So the second method for operative evacuations is entrostomy. The third option will be resection and primary anastomosis. You can resect, remove the segment with the insubicated meconium and perform a primary anastomosis. Occasionally perform it, however, it is not preferred. Success depends on the removal of the old compromised bowel, complete evacuation of the meconium, and the preserving adequate blood supply. However, the reported complications may be reported between 21 to 31 percent, which is not low complication. Number four, to perform a stoma creation. Actually, this is preferred by many surgeons. We have three types of stoma. What's called Michiolex entrostomy, what's called Bishop Cub entrostomy, or Santoli entrostomy. We will give some details. Michiolex, it is a side-to-side -side entrostomy. 
Both loops are side to side and stomos. It is a quick procedure. No need for intraoperative meconium evacuation. Minimal intraperitoneal contamination as bowel loops can be opened after complete abdominal closure. Number three, no intra-abdominal anastomosis, so we have no risk for leakage. This is the first type of stoma called micheolics, side-to-side introstomy, quick procedure with less complication. The second one is what's called bishop coup. This depends on the proximal loop anastomosed to the side of the distal. So the proximal loop will anastomose to the side of the distal like this. And resection uh, of the dilated bowel, because there is usually there is will be uh, unequality between both edges. So to make anastomosis, you must resect the proximal end of the bro proximal ileal loop. By these methods, you will perform decompression of the proximal stoma. Also, you can wash through the distal bowel. So you can irrigate, like this arrow, you can irrigate fluids through the distal bowel to remove insipicated mucus. So in such cases, it is what's called bishop coup, the proximal loop, and a stomos to the side of the distal, and the side brought out as a terminal stoma. You must resect the dilated proximal bowel, to make the caliber equal to allow for equal anastomosis. Number three, this stoma allow for decompression of the proximal stoma. Also, post operative wash through the distal stoma is available. Centrally, the reverse. Distal bowel end is anastomosed to the side of the proximal. This is the proximal and the distal anastomosed to the side of the proximal like this. Irrigation of the distal in such cases require insertion of soft cassifer, like this caster, like this one, to reach the distal. Not easy, like the bishop coat. Also, this proximal loop, proximal loop will be an high output fistula. So high output fistula, there is, will be a risk for dehydration of the baby. And this type of stoma require early closure within four weeks to decrease this high output fistula. So in such cases, the distal loop anastomosed to the side of the proximal and the proximal brought outside as a stoma. This proximal loop will perform high output fistula with risk of dehydrations and also irrigations for the distal will be difficult. Irrigations for the distal will require insertion of the soft caster. This advantage, of the stoma formation, high output, stoma, bowel lens loss, you need second surgery to reestablish the bowel continuity. Recent studies document that Bishop Coop is a safe choice with minimal stoma complications. In cases of the complicated meconium ileus, always operative intervention is required. Our goal is to relieve the intestinal obstructions and to preserve maximal intestinal lens. The rare exception for non-operative management of complicated meconium ileus is what's called sealed perforation, spontaneously sealed perforation with intact intestinal continuity. So the indications of the surgery will be presence of peritonitis, persistent obstructions, abdominal mass, or sepsis. Surgical management will include debridement of the necrotic tissue. And if there is a pseudocyst, you must perform pseudocyst resection and diverting the stoma like simple meconium ileus, antibiotics, and meticulous post-operative care. However, creation of the stoma is the fastest and safest choice without fear of from the bowel size, discrepancy or leakage or obstructions and with, uh, without fear for the delay of bowel activity. Peritonitis best managed with introstomy. In all cases, don't forget to take a biopsy to diagnose Hirschsprung total clonic, extended the small intestinal to diagnose cystic fibrosis. Segmental volvulus and intestinal atresia without contaminations, we can perform a resection, irrigations, primary anastomosis in a stable patient with safe state of the intestine, although the complication is still reported. 
Regarding the post-operative management, we must continue the resuscitations, replacement of the losses. As we know that enema will draw fluids inside the intestinal union. This may cause dehydration, even hypovolemic shock in the child. So you must continue to replace insensible fluid loss and gastrointestinal fluid loss. Also in the post-operative course, we can use N-style cysteine via the nasogastric enterostomy or ileostomy or fistula to dissolve the residual insipicated meconium. Stoma usually closed at about four to six weeks to avoid the fluid electrolyte and nutritional losses and cholestatic joints. Regarding feeding, in uncomplicated feed, in uncomplicated meconium ileus, we can start with a breast milk or infant formula. Pancreatic enzymes and vitamins is essential, especially in children with cystic fibrosis. However, take care and caution must be taken when prescribing pancreatic enzymes, as excessive enzyme dose may lead to a condition called fibrosing colonopathy, and we will discuss it soon. Also, inadequate enzymes may cause what's called distal intestinal obstruction syndrome, or meconium alias equivalent. So be cautious when prescribed or dealing with the pancreatic enzymes. Patient with complicated meconium alias or significant loss of the intestinal lens, initially fed with pre-digested and diluted low formula. Uh, if tolerated, concentrations can be increased, then the volume of the fed can be increased. Pancreatic enzymes, 2,000 to 4,000 lipase unit per 120 milli of full strength formula can be added as a supplementation for this infant with cystic fibrosis. On the other hand, infant with meconium alias are at increased risk for cholestasis, particularly if they are receiving the TBN, alkaline phosphatase, ALT, AST, and bilirubin should be monitored weekly in this infant. Fluid and the nutritional status of the infant with significant power resection, if we resect more than one third, may be difficult to manage. In addition, the presence of ileostomy may cause high output stoma, excessive loss of the fluids and sodium. So please be cautious about this nutritional management of these infants. If you have an access to the distal bowel, drip of the glutamine enriched formula, or in some cases, installations of the effluent from the proximal stoma to enhance bowel growth and prevent the bowel transloc bacterial translocation. So we can take some secretions from the proximal and re-inject it to the distal. It's very important if we can, access, we can have an access to the distal. Double barrel entrostomy, we have an access to the distal. And in such cases, we can aspirate or remove the proximal and inject it inside the distal. Also, we can use a drip of the glutamine enhanced formula. All this to increase the bowel growth and prevent bacterial translocations in the distal bowel. Also, there is another important point. In infant with short bowel syndrome, due to resection of large segment of the bowel, there is maybe gastric hyperacidity. This acidic environment will inhibit or inactivate the pancreatic enzymes. So in such infant, we can use a proton bump inhibitors to uh, be uh, admi administered with the pancreatic enzymes in the patient with significant bowel resection. Moreover, patient with excessive sweat and intestinal sodium loss may develop total body sodium deficit. So please, urine sodium measured in infant with ileostomies, and if the serum sodium, even if the serum sodium is normal, urine sodium less than 10 milli equivalent needs sodium supplementation, or even by car very important. As we know that the pathology 
in cystic fibrosis is excessive loss of sodium and chloride in the sweat. So this infant may be susceptible to total body sodium deficiency. So please measure the urine sodium in such babies, especially with ileostomies. Even the serum sodium is not. Pulmonary disease. Pulmonary disease is the first presentation of the cystic fibrosis, very important. Maybe chronic lung disease from the mucus plugging, atelectasis, so prophylactic pulmonary care and chest physiotherapy initiated early in the post-operative period. Also, head down position should be avoided to decrease the risk of the GERD and aspiration. Now we will go to speak about what's called meconium blood syndrome. Meconium blood syndrome explained by that there is maybe altered clonic motility, character of the meconium, a change in preventing its normal passage. Normally, the terminal, two santi of the meconium, is firm in texture and called the meconium cap. Most newborn pass this cap before or during or shortly after birth. However, in certain cases, like this picture, this is the meconium blood, will be this meconium cap obstructing the lower part of the gastrointestinal tract. Failure to pass this plug is called meconium blood syndrome, and this babies is termed as plugged up babies. As we see, this is sick, long meconium plug obstructing the colon and removed. Presentation will be like meconium ileus, failure to pass meconium, bilious vomiting distension, often the meconium blood dislodged following the BR examinations uh, of the anus and will be uh, removed and dislodged. We have about 30% of spontaneous resolution without any treatment and the colon function usually no following this plaque passage. However, suspect cystic fibrosis when there is a small left colon syndrome, Hirsch sprung, congenital hypothyroidism, maternal addictions, or intestinal neuronal dysplasia. The contrast enema will be diagnostic and therapeutic. Sweet test must be performed to exclude associated cystic fibrosis and also TSH level to exclude congenital hypothyroidism. We may need rectal biopsy if there is dysfunctional stooling better after resolutions of the plug and if we have chronic constipation. Now, we will speak about an important subject, which is complications of the meconium ileus and cystic fibrosis. Actually, the story of the meconium ileus baby don't end after the evacuation of the insipicated meconium, creating a stoma or closure of the stoma. This infant and babies may have a long-term sequelae, may have a complications related to the genetically associated cystic fibrosis. So please take care that this infant may have gastroesophageal reflux disease, biliary tract disease, what's called distal intestinal obstruction syndrome, may have appendicitis, intersusception, or finally what's called fibrosing colonopathy. So we can go rapid through each one of these complications. Gastroesophageal reflux, common in cystic fibrosis in children. There's maybe pulmonary aspiration with failure to thrive, deteriorated pulmonary function. Also histological esophagitis present in more than 50%. Gastroesophageal reflux, may reach high reported rate in cystic fibrosis children. However, typical gastrointestinal symptoms usually absent. So diagnostic procedure should be performed regardless of symptoms, which is very important observation. Anti-reflux medication, just physiotherapy and head up are the start methods for the treatment of this infant. If no response, shift to anti-reflux procedure. Laparoscopic nissen fund application will improve the respiratory functions in cystic fibrosis in children with mild versus moderate disease. Also gastrostomy 
may be needed if there is inadequate caloric intake to support the caloric intake for such infant. Anti-reflux surgery, very important to stop the advancement of the metablesia in case of parathesophagus. In a case of metablesia, endoscopic monitoring is essential. And any dysplastic esophageal changes must be evaluated for anti-reflux surgery. The second complications will be related to the biliary tract disease. Children with cystic fibrosis may have pancreatic hepatic diseases, may have a gallbladder disease. Pancreatic disease, there is maybe multiple cysts replacing the pancreas, insufficiency of the exoprime pancreas, fatty replacement of the pancreas, fibrosis. There is maybe associated hepatic and pancreatic disorders or in some infant may be isolated hepatic dysfunction with normal pancreas. Most common hepatic complications may be related to cholangiectasis, neonatal cholestasis, pilary cirrhosis, cholelysiasis, sclerosing cholangitis. All these complications may happen. Neonatal intrahepatic cholestasis may be associated with ductal hypoplasia or aplasia. All these neonates are at increased risk for cholestatic jaundice. Also prolonged jaundice unresponsive to the treatment with non-dilated bile duct and the gallbladder. Absent biliary excretions on the nuclear scan and diagnostic liver biopsy will help to reach the diagnosis. Liver cirrhosis present in three points, three point of young patient with cystic fibrosis, also splenomegaly, thrombocytopenia. Portosystemic shunt and partial splenectomy, all these are conservative or palliative treatment. The only curative treatment for such cases is liver transplantation. Double or triple organ transplantation may be needed, and also diabetes is a common complication after transplantation. On the other hand, gallbladder disease, common in cystic fibrosis in children, cholelysiasis up to 24% was reported, micro gallbladders, many patients are asymptomatic, with only 4% are symptomatic gallbladder disease. Stones usually reduce, so ultrasound recommended. Stone in such infant is not cholesterol supersaturated. It is composed of proteins and calcium bicarb. Also, acalculars cholecystitis recently reported in some children. Symptomatic gallbladder need laparoscopic cholecystectomy. However, intraoperative cholangiogram or perioperative ERCB is not needed as there is low incidence of CBD stones in cystic fibrosis patient. Usually there is difficult ERCB for this patient due to the presence of the biliary tract abnormalities, which make the penetrations of the radiolucent dye very difficult. Also, intraoperative Cholangiography is indicated if there is jaundice, pancreatitis, cholangitis, dilated CBD stone or bulbable stone in the common bile duct. The third complication is what is called distal intestinal obstruction syndrome. Distal intestinal obstruction syndrome is called meconium alias equivalent due to the similarity between the symptoms and that of meconium alias. There is recurrent partial or complete intestinal obstructions in teenager and younger patient with cystic fibrosis. It is secondary to abnormal visit mucoficulant materials in the distal ileum and the right colon causing obstruction to the bowel. May be related to small intestinal motility, may be related to the thickening of the chyme with undigested proteins and the fat, may be related to the precipitation of the undigested proteins, pile acids, usually may be related to the hyperviscosity, abnormal regulation of the mucines, the same pathology of the cystic fibrosis. Precipitating factors, usually sudden withdrawal of the pancreatic enzyme. As we said that be cautious when dealing with pancreatic enzyme supplementation as excess enzymes may lead to fibrosing colonobacy, little or inadequate enzymes may cause distal intestinal obstruction syndrome. Distal intestinal obstruction syndrome usually associated with 
exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, malabsorptions, severe pulmonary limitations, usually increased following organ transplantation in these patients. The child will present with crampy abdominal pain, localized to the right lower quadrant, decreased the frequency of defecations, and depleting abdominal pain in the common presentation. Physical examinations, there is, will be in uncomplicated cases, abdominal distensions, tender mass, no peritonitis, no fecal impactions on rectal examination. Partial or complete obstructions, vomiting and abdominal distension obstipation is usually present. As we can see, we may find in the X-ray that there is maybe distended small bowel with a scattered air fluid level. Distended bowel with a scattered air fluid level, or we may find that ground glass mixing of the air with insubicated meconium in the lower, uh, lower right quadrant, like the meconium, like infant with meconium ileus. So you call it meconium ileus equivalent, distal intestinal obstruction syndrome, or meconium ileus equivalent. Water soluble contrast enema will demonstrate insubicated material in the right colon also exclude ileocolic intersusception. Moreover, the contrast study itself can be therapeutic. Diagnosis is usually difficult. You must take in consideration the diagnostic dilemma in this patient, maybe intersusception, mechanically small bowel obstruction, appendicitis, Crohn's disease, biliary tract disease, present with the same presentation. Medical management may be indicated in the absence of the mechanical intestinal obstruction. We may perform a trial of medical manage aiming to relieve this bowel obstruction. At first, we start with volume resuscitation, clonic enema, wash out with gastrographene, may be given orally also or by nasogastric. Alternatively, if the child is large, we can, uh, he or she may ingest non-absorbable intestinal lavage solution. Aggressive laxative treatment, oral laxative may be given. Younger patients require the neurogastric, however older can ingest the sufficient volumes of this lavage. Successful treatment will be presented by passage of the stool and resolution of the symptoms, disappearance of the palpable right iliac fossa mass. If the symptoms still persist, Differential diagnosis must be reconsidered and recent recommendations for prophylaxis against distal intestinal obstruction syndrome is to keep these children or infant on scheduled laxative and high fibers diet. Operative indication. If we have complete obstruction or evidence of peritonitis, if we have previous laboratory and history of meconium ileus. In such cases, we must perform nasogastric tube decompressions and adequate resuscitations. And at laboratory, the bowel will usually feel thickened and filled with tenacious material like meconium ileus in infant. We must perform a decompression for this bowel loop irrigations via small catheter through wither appendicular stump as for an complicated meconium ileus. Very important. Also, irrigating a tube may be left in situ to regain the bowel post-operative. Some children may be in need for lysis of the adhesion, power resections with either primary anastomosis or sometimes stoma creation. Number four, appendicitis. Appendicitis, abdominal pain, very common in cystic fibrosis patient due to chronic antibiotics and destroyed use or associated pulmonary diseases. This chronic use make the classic presentations is very difficult. So there is increased incidence of diagnosed uh, appendicular perforation. Appendix will be dilated by the intraluminal materials of insubicated succus and also acute appendicitis may mimic the distal intestinal obstruction syndrome and the intersusception. So please be very cautious. Despite the masked clinical signs, this infant and children may have fever, leukocytosis. However, perforated appendix is high. Depending on the appendix locations, contrast enema may show the cecal deformity, associated mass 
lack of the typical insipicated materials of distal intestinal obstruction syndrome. When there is perforations, ultrasound or CT will show free fluid or abscess in the region of the cecum. Initial treatment will be percutaneous drainage of the abscess, interval appendectomy, and appendectomy required in non-acute, non-perforated appendicitis. If you still in adult diagnosis, diagnostic laparoscopy must be performed. Many surgeons perform incidental appendectomy during other abdominal operation. The fifth complication is intersusception. Intersussceptions usually present a different age, unlike the usual presentation of intersusceptions in the general pediatric population. The onset of appearance of intersusception in such children is at the age of about nine and a half years. However, the idiopathic intersusceptions may be appear during the first six months of life. Intersusceptions in older children, history of recurrent pulmonary infection, you must test for cystic fibrosis. Commonly, intersusceptions is iliocolic. However, ilioelial or cecocolic may be present. Abnormally, stick meconium adhere to the bowel and act at the lead point. So the lead point here is the abnormal stick meconium. It will be stick to the bowel. And so this is the lead point for initiations of intersusception. Or maybe the appendix controversially exists with where is the lead point for the initiation of this intersusception. Some report high success rate with hydrostatic reductions. Other report report least optimal result and the need for exploration. If the intersusception is unable to reduce, bowel resections with anastomosis is indicated. Appendix should be removed in the operations in infant or child with intersusception. The last one is what's called fibrosing colonopathy. Fibrosing colonopathy, simply clonic structures present with the same signs and symptoms of distal intestinal obstruction syndrome in infant with cystic fibrosis. There is clonic structure, mucosal and submucosal fibrosis, destruction of the musculosa with ulcerations, sometimes healed ulceration. Related to the change of the pancreatic enzymes, change from conventional enzymes to high strength pancreatic enzymes. In increasing the dose is a very important factor, increasing the dose of the pancreatic enzymes. Diagnosis considered in children or patients using high-dose pancreatic enzymes, abdominal pain, distension, chylus ascites, a change in the bowel habit, failure to thrive. There is a problem that these children present with continued diarrhea. So this feature may lead the patient think that this is maybe related to insufficient pancreatic enzyme supplementation. So they start to increase the pancreatic enzymes further. So increasing the pancreatic enzymes will worsen the case and make more fibrosing colonopathy. So this idea may be mistaken by the family at the presence of the diarrhea, link it in their mind to the deficiency of pancreatic enzymes. Barium enema will show irregularities, loss of frustrations, and the structures formation. Colonoscopy also will show erythematous mucosa narrowing and multiple biopsy is usually needed. Initially, these children treated with pancreatic enzyme reductions. We said before, we start with 2,000 to 4,000. In such cases, we start from 500 to 2,500 lipase unit. Patient with market failure to thrive or obstructions may need operative intervention. Preoperative bowel preparation is controversial. To perform preoperative bowel or not, preparation or not. The aim of the operative intervention is to resect the affected bowel with fibrosing colonopathy. It's to perform primary anastomosis. However, it is not possible with total clonic. If we find the case with total clonic involvement or rectal involvement, in such cases, ileostomy or colostomy. However, after all this treatment, resection, primary anastomosis, it is not clear if the patient will benefit 
and will be get better after this treatment or not. So the regular follow-up is mandatory for such patients. Finally, we must speak about the prognosis of the meconium ileus and children with cystic fibrosis. Early, there is a reported poor prognosis despite all operative treatment with mortality rate approaching 50%. Also, the nutritional status suggests that the children with meconium ileus suffer more long-term complications and other problems than children with cystic fibrosis without meconium ileus. Recently, there is reported improved prognosis aiming to the advances in the prenatal diagnosis, pulmonary neonatal care and the nutrition antibiotics, improved understanding of the pathophysiology and the treatment of the complications. Survival rate also increased in uncomplicated meconium ileus. Previously, it was thought that the cystic fibrosis patient with the meconium ileus had a worse outcome. However, several recent studies demonstrated that pulmonary function not different between those children with cystic fibrosis and the meconium ileus and those children with cystic fibrosis without meconium ileus. Operative mortality decreased considerably in the past four decades, and the mortality rate decreased also for uh, patients with peritonitis. Management of the surgical patient include respiratory care, nutritional support, and pancreatic enzymes. Don't forget that children with meconium ileus need long-term follow-up as they prone to develop distal intestinal obstruction syndrome, fibrosing chronopathy. Late complications may include in the meconium ileus of children, gallstones, cirrhosis, male sterility. As we said at the start, there is maybe congenital absence, bilateral absence of the vas difference. In such cases, we severe genetic mutations of cystic fibrosis. So at the end of this uh, subject, we must stress that meconium ileus is the one cause for neonatal intestinal obstruction. In all cases of neonatal obst intestinal obstruction, there is will be failure to bus meconium. However, this failure may be related to anatomical or functional obstruction, maybe caused by atresia, maybe caused by vulvas, maybe caused by intersusception, may be related to Hirschsprung disease, may be related to mal, uh, mal rotation of the intestine. However, meconium ileus, in such cases, the disease in the meconium. So we call it disease the meconium or the meconium disease. Cystic fibrosis is genetically associated with meconium ileus. And it may be the first presentation of cystic fibrosis. It is a genetically lethal disease, must be excluded in every child or neonate with meconium ileus. There is a long-term sequelae for children with meconium ileus. The story will not end with evacuation of insufficient meconium with a conservative or by using enema or by performing a stoma. These children need long-term follow-up to detect the long-term sequel, gastroesophageal reflux, maybe biliary tract, hepatica or pancreatic gallbladder, maybe distal intestinal obstruction syndrome later in the teenager, may be related to fibrosing colonobacy with symptoms of obstruction, increased incidence of appendicitis in such children and the infant, intersusceptions is likely to develop, so they need long-term follow-up. At first, you must diagnose where in every child with or neonate with meconium ileus is this is a cystic fibrosis related meconium obstruction or this infant with non-cystic fibrosis meconium obstruction. Thank you very much and see you later in the next subject of pediatric surgery made easy.